Hello everybody, this is another Pass the Baton interview with the Centre for Technology Enhanced Learning or CTEL at Lancaster University. As you'll know if you've seen other episodes in our Pass the Baton interviews, the Centre's alumni and doctoral researchers interview each other, the interviewee becomes the interviewer and so on, hence the name Pass the Baton. Uh, if we include today's chat there'll be I think five batons going around by spring 2022 all heading in different directions which is great nobody really knows where they'll end up um, we're kind of guessing where they are currently to be frank so that's exciting and interesting today I'm lucky to be chatting with the fantastic Jane Nodder Jane's a fellow alumni member of CTEL uh, with a background in nutritional medicine has been doing a fair bit of activity theoretical research of late and we'll find a bit more about all of that in a while. So that's great. I'll just explain the format to people, Jane, and then we'll get going. Um, okay. If there are still people who aren't familiar with that format in these conversations, the interviewer, and today that's me, the interviewer picks somebody from the CTEL alumni or doctoral research community who they've always wanted to ask a few questions about tell. And today I've asked Jane and I was lucky that she said yes. Um, the intended audience uh, tends to be people thinking about the TEL programme at Lancaster, people currently on the programme, people who've completed but for one reason or another aren't members of the centre just yet. If that does describe you, please get in touch, we'll keep you all informed, we'll add you to a, an email list that we've got, it's relatively informal. Um, and if you're watching on YouTube, uh, don't forget to click subscribe at the top right and you'll get notified when we upload new content. We've planned for around a 20 minute format. So Jane and I will quickly say hello now and then we'll get going. I'm Phil Moffat. I'm a teaching focus lecturer at the Royal School of Military Engineering down here in Kent in the UK. And I'm one of the alumni members of the centre. I keep forgetting, but I think I was in cohort eight of the TEL programme. I remember the people really, really well, just not necessarily the number. I'm interested in technology and expansive learning particularly for people like engineers, facilities managers. Uh, they tend to be in high reliability organisations, defence, emergency services and such. And they I tend to identify a need for learning only at that time and point of need, if that makes sense. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, Jane, what you do when you went through the doctoral programme and what you've been doing lately? Yes, of course. Thanks, Phil. Thanks very much. And thanks for inviting me to take part in the Pass the Baton um, initiative, which is really interesting. So I'm Jane Nodder and I am based in the beautiful medieval city of York in the north of England. I work at the Northern College of Acupuncture, although I'm not an acupuncturist. I'm actually a nutrition practitioner and um, my role in the college is um, currently as mainly as a research supervisor for MSc students, although I also do teach. Uh, still, and prior to uh, going into this um, role, I was the leader of three, uh, course director for three online MSc um, programs for healthcare practitioners internationally that started back in 2012. And it was really that, I guess, that sparked my interest in doing a PhD in TEL. Um, I'd started previously a PhD in nutritional medicine and kind of didn't really feel that was quite where I wanted to go. So in 2017, I joined cohort 11 at Lancaster University um, to do my PhD in education research. Um, and I was already researching online learning um, before the pandemic hit and the whole topic became hugely uh, popular. So that's kind of a little bit about me. Oh, that's great. Thanks. I must admit, you all seem to be doing a lot of extra stuff. It always amazes me how, I suppose, how different our CTEL community is in terms of experiences, but also in other ways, how similar we are and what drives us towards yeah. seeking knowledge and meaning, you know. Absolutely, um, fascinating yeah. Fascinating experiences, thanks. Um, so in all that time, um, and in, in terms of what you've been working on, can you tell us what TEL has come to mean to you, perhaps how the PhD programme is making a difference to your conceptions of TEL? How you yeah, absolutely. So I didn't really know very much about education research when I came into this programme. I'd worked as an educator for 25 years. I was 15 years at Westminster University before I moved to York. Um, but I went into education as a practitioner. So I was asked whether I could teach a few students about 
a certain topic and it's like yeah that's fine and then when I got there it's like oh and can you supervise in the clinic and it's like can you do this and can you do that so I went from doing a couple of lectures to working full time for 20 plus years leading programs and developing programs but very much from the sort of academic to what we call pracademic so practitioner academic um and I think what I'm really interested in is in is how can research practically help us on the front line? I'm not really interested in just writing sort of something that can sit on the shelf, but it's like, what can we actually do? So the topic for my um, PhD research is the professional development needs of online educators. So what do they need? What do they need to get the start of their career? What do they need through their career? And typically speaking, a lot of this has been identified um, through the sort of face-to-face -face physical classroom type of work rather than the online environment and um, a lot of online educators don't get really any structured professional development in their career so um, and most of the studies have looked at um, have looked at sort of have been done by people who don't actually teach online mm. so or work online so the work that I've done um, has really been trying to gather information firsthand from online educators around what they need with regard to their own professional development and how that can be taken forward. So it's the use of technology, if you like, as a delivery mode, as a part of the teaching and learning environment, and also part of, part of the research environment as well. Okay. And so that's where my interest has kind of grown. I didn't really know what I was going to do when I started in the program. Um, I kind of worked that out as I went along. I just knew that it needed to be practical and something that could be used and applied kind of on the front line, really. Otherwise, it's kind of, in my opinion, it's sort of, well, what's the point, you know? Just the stuff. to activity theory, I suppose. Um, yeah, yeah. So I've used activity theory and like Phil, I've used the change lab as um, a methodology on intervention to color, to generate my data, uh, to look at what it is that we might be able to do to change the tensions and the, and the challenges within the sort of uh, higher education institutions in the in the UK. Okay, and if you're watching and you're unfamiliar with activity theory and or uh, the change lab methodology, I'll um, I'll put some uh, pieces in the notes in the comments on YouTube, um, just as links to people who might be unfamiliar things that Jade and I would both have, I suppose, have read to incentivise us to take those approaches. So in terms of your own personal journey, where are you on that chain in terms of, you know, MSc to PhD to what comes next? Where, where are you on okay. that? Okay. So my personal journey um, with my actual PhD, I'm kind of probably about halfway through doing the writing up now. I've done quite a big chunk of it. I've largely got the lit review and the discussion to, to write, but otherwise I'm kind of into the feedbacking process. I'm getting feedback on my work. So I'm hoping to get this thing completely nailed this year and finished. Um, it's been a long journey. Um, I first started on my PhD journey in 2012, having finished my MSc in 2011. Um, so I want to finish now. And um, what I'm hoping to do then is to see, well, two things really. One is to see how I can take what I've found and try and help make it applicable in the profession. So the group of people that I worked with to generate my data are actually continuing um, in the sort of format of this thing called the Change Laboratory. They're continuing to meet and address their professional development needs. So they meet every couple of months. And I've become as like a member of that group as opposed to the researcher. And it's really interesting how they're driving that forward. So I'd like to carry on some more research there because they're using technology to enhance their, their learning in, in that setup as well. Um, and the other thing I'd like to do is that one of the things I've identified through my research is that there's a sense that we need to get some data on the student perspective of this. Um, what do students actually think that their tutors and educators need in terms of development um, approaches and skills? And that's a really kind of under researched area. So it's not about feedback on how well the modules are delivered and you know whether they like it or not. It's more about how skilled their tutors are, perhaps, and what kind of things they feel might enhance their teaching and learning experience. So I'm hoping to see whether I can get a bit of funding to maybe do a small piece of work with with some students to kind of gather a bit more data to fill out the information a bit more and, and hopefully at some point this might lead towards a bit of a framework for taking forward the development we'll see 
Um, oh, good luck with that. Okay. Yeah, I'm also looking to retire, gradually working towards retiring, so I don't know how much longer I'll have the energy to kind of do this, um, yeah. kind of things I want to do as well. <laughs> but yeah, I'd like to see it go into something, I don't want it to just... And I'm also fascinated by the change laboratory as a as an intervention approach, and when I kind of got to the point of what am I going to write about for my thesis, I had kind of two paths, I could have gone down the path of the topic of the professional development, or I could have down, gone down the path of the, the change lab as an intervention and writing that up. So I've got a couple of other irons in the fire for doing some of that change lab work and contributing yeah. to the literature in that field as well. So yeah, we'll see. But the main task at the moment is to keep my head down and, and just get it finished and get over the bar. Yeah, um, that's quite a nice segue to uh, another question that I'd like to ask. We ask this of everyone. Is there is there anything that you'd like to pass on to people who are considering the programme or who will soon be in the position of moving into the doctoral research phase? Any, any words yeah. on this? I think it, it's really important to think about, if you're, if you're choosing a programme, then for me it was important to think about how do I best like to work. And I chose this particular programme at Lancaster because of its cohort structure and the fact that in the first couple of years, you know, you're working with colleagues. I knew I was coming into a new discipline um, and I really valued the fact that there was a structure that kept me on track, it kept me going, it, there were set deadlines, I had to achieve them. Um, I think moving into the part two and the doctoral research element of it, that kind of breaks down a bit, that sort of structure. And so you do need, I've found that I need to be pretty motivated um, to keep it going and to drive myself um, through the whole process. So I found that bit not so bad when I was generating data. And again, because I had quite solid structures to adhere to and timings that I had to keep to it's been tougher on the writing upside. I'm, I personally am not great at sitting for hours writing stuff on my own. Yeah. Um, so I've built up a lot of, I've built up a lot of networks so that I can connect with other people. I write with other people online. I'm part of a number of different groups where we um, come together and sort of share. And um, so I'm not doing it on my own and that's, partly people at Lancaster, but actually it's mainly people doing PhDs in other unis that I've met through other networks that I've been, kind of made myself go out and find, if you like, to make the journey a bit less lonely. Oh, good uh, for you. I so bet, yeah, we're looking so at that. The flip side of that, knowing, knowing you as I do, I suspect what you're underestimating is the assistance you're giving to others as well. It must be quite a nice thing to be a, a part of that. The, the yeah. kind of whole is greater than the sum of the parts kind of thing, isn't it? Yeah, so like I have a, a buddy at a different university and every week we, uh, and on a Monday, we email each other what we're planning to do in the week and when we're, actually when we're planning to do it, he works full time, I don't work full time, but he's working full time and so he struggles to really carve time out from his job. Um, so that level of accountability and then we, we, we touch in on a Friday and sort of say what we've managed to do and recently, he and a couple of others as they're in another group have started um writing online together just just even for an hour if we've got an hour we're just signing what you're going to do in the next hour right on with it at the end what did you do great you know um oh, nice. and then we meet once a month we have a actual chat on zoom and that's been working we've been doing that since about september last year and that's been working really well and has helped both of us really so um i think it is important to kind of share there's somebody in the next cohort on from us, cohort 12, who I also have a chat with just once a month. We just get on and, and have a chat. She might be my past the baton. She doesn't know that yet, but. <laughs> Great. Um, is, there, is there anything in terms of the CTEL activities that you find helpful? I really, really enjoyed being part of CTEL. Um, again, as a distance student or an online student, it's difficult to find a home. It's not like you're going into the uni every day or you have a desk or a department where you can kind of sit and be. Um, I've only been to Lancaster twice for the residential weeks in this programme. And actually they were another quite strong attractor for this programme. The fact that there are these, I think they're face to face again now, but these weeks in Lancaster where you get intensive teaching, but it's very much a social kind of gathering as well. Um, so um, the CTEL, when that came up, I've really enjoyed being part of that because it's helped me to feel part of the community. 
Um, it's really interesting to see what everyone else is doing. It's given me opportunities to present my work in a reasonably benign kind of environment and get some feedback and also to listen to and give feedback on other people's work. And by being part of the, um, there's a term sort of business, business meetings that CTEL hold. Um, again, it's a way of finding out what's going on, opportunities to contribute, to build on uh, maybe research other people are doing. And it was through the, the CTEL connection that um, I got involved with a wider group of change laboratory researchers internationally um, that was set up last year. And that's been another great community to just be part of. So I think that sense of community, the sense of being able to connect in with other people and just to find out more about what's going on. So even things like Lancaster being involved in, you know, the some of the projects in the community yeah. um, in that area, it's just really interesting. And um, I think it's, it's not too demanding, doesn't come up too often, but it's regular enough for you to connect in. So I think I've been a reasonably um, committed member to, to turning up to meetings and you know people are making an effort to do these things so I think it's good to, to join in but it's mainly the connectivity and the community that I've really valued. Well that's great. Um, is there anything that you think we're not talking about enough with regards to technology enhanced learning? Could be related to your own field, could be a broader observation? I think it's um, trying to understand what what this kind of technology enhanced learning actually is. Mm. You know, so, what do we mean by that? How I think some people that I know in the program have struggled a bit to find a tell element to what they want to do. They've had to kind of work out what they want to do and then try and shoehorn it into <laughs> the tell umbrella. Yeah. Um, so it's a bit of a I'm not sure how clear we always are about what it act what tell actually is and what that means to people. Um, and also the program has the kind of e-research tag on it as well. And it's like, well, what's that then? You know, yeah. what's the e-research element of it? And I'm still not entirely clear on that person myself, but I think there's a bit more that could perhaps be made of defining um, the, our, the terminology and what we're using and what kind of framework that has around it but that's just my perspective I guess other people who may be more heavily immersed in this role and I know we've got certainly people in my co who, who are a lot more um, savvy around mobile learning and a lot of at work and people who are working in schools and have got a different kind of view of how technology is actually perhaps applied um, to the way that I've kind of used it in my um, in my career really. Yeah I mean in one sense it would be incredibly helpful to have a I suppose a globally agreed definition in another sense we'd lose something because we'd stop talking about it so much and how problematic it is and the fact yeah. that it means different things to different people in a, in a way is the strength of a lot of bits of research you read isn't it? It is and, and I think also that you know obviously technology has played a massive role in the last couple of years with the pandemic I mean when I started doing my research it was like well, okay, yeah, that sounds all right. And then suddenly, as the pandemic hit, I found myself being called in to help out all over the place with the, can you help us get these programs online? And what do you know about how we do this and how we do yeah. that? And it was just quite incredible to see how little, how, how unprepared a lot of very experienced people in academia the academic life were for the shift online and how how fearful people were around it all as well and I think that still kind of carries on because it from where I sit teaching and learning online it's not the same as teaching and learning on the campus in a campus classroom there are similarities of course there are but just establishing your whole kind of presence online is, is totally different yeah. and uh, I think a lot of people have struggled with that let alone just the sheer tech for making material available etc etc yeah. so you know, there was a big step up required and, and suddenly the work that I was doing seemed quite popular. <laughs> yeah, somebody I work with imploded when um, somebody described it as a pivot to online yeah. learning. Uh, you know, they just really didn't take well to that. They said, if you if you think we've just pivoted to online, you've entirely missed everything that's been going on. Mm -hmm. it was, uh, and there's been some quite interesting papers coming out on the back of the, the pivot as such as it's become known and uh, what we 
kind of did well and what was done less well. I mean, I guess they'll start to subside a bit now because it's, but now everybody's fixated on the sort of hybrid and how is hybrid going to work? Um, yeah. And uh, I think that's, uh, for me, that's a lot more challenging. Having having some learners kind of there physically in the classroom and some learners there online in the same session, I think that's a lot more challenging than just doing the whole thing online yeah. or the whole thing on campus. So. And one of the first things we have to do, of course, is make sure everyone understands that that's what hybrid means because you see some competing definitions where they think it's a bit online it's, it's, hmm. anyway um we're nudging against 20 minutes quite all right strong. okay yeah that went quick um, it did it was fascinating it was really kind of you to meet with us and to share your experiences um but... if i could ask you it's it might be a bit of an awkward question to answer so i'm going to try and frame it as uh, as neutrally as i can when it comes to your interview i think it's probably a bit strong to ask who you're going to interview but um what kind of characteristics will you be looking for in somebody you're going to interview do you know um i think certainly somebody with a something of a story you know, that can tell uh somebody who's maybe somebody who's not been quite so engaged with CTEL to sort of try and understand a little bit what they know about that or mm. don't know about that. So we might be able to see a bit more where we can reach out or the reasons um, for perhaps not engaging. That might be interesting. Mm. And then perhaps somebody with a, um, a different kind of spin on technology enhanced learning, maybe something a bit more community focused or lifelong learning focused, this kind of element I think would be interesting rather than something in pure academia. Yeah, well, that's great. That's fascinating. Well, thanks for everything. It's been great speaking with you. Wish you all the best for your future tele endeavors, whatever they may be. Thank you. Uh, and all I need to do is you go. There's a baton for you to take. Thanks, and Phil. You will. Um, <laughs> Thanks very much and I'll see you soon, Jane. Cheerio. Good in. Thanks, Phil, for all your help as well. Thank you.